music of the spheres is music to my ears It's soft melody is soothing moving me to tears I woke up in a cave I saw the shadows on the wall and the shackles on the saw didn't even know I was a slave The dawn of me was when I made an armory Simple utensils and basic pottery Went on an odyssey, sailed the coldest dark of seas I got seasick, at least I had Hippocrates I met Siddhartha the Buddha and he walked with me He let me go but... um, He is the director of the educational outreach for Beltway and Atheists and he has a master's in biology and has specialized in malaria pathogenesis um, He's also the current president of the Virginia Herpetological Society and he manages the biosafety and laser safety program at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Janelia Farm Research Campus in Ashburn Mr. Mendoza was raised a Catholic in Italy and he, in his love for science and biology, eventually led him to leave the church and he is now an outspoken and active leader in his community. Please welcome Larry Mendoza. Hi, thank you very much. Can uh, you guys see this again? So the take, lights, so turn off the lights, maybe during the presentation. There All right, that'll be good. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I'm actually honored to be here. I, uh, I came here last year uh, and did a similar talk, so I'm really happy to be back here and actually talk to even, even a bigger group. Um, so what I want to do today is uh, kind of have even a discussion uh, on evolution and creation. You hear about it in the news all the time, especially in politics, because for some reason evolution and creationism, intelligent design, these kinds of ideas have become very politicized. So what I want to do here is kind of uh, break down what it actually, uh, what evolution actually means, and what creationism actually means, and, and uh, within creationism also the uh, subfield of intelligent design. And I kind of want to discuss uh, in a way where should we really look at this as both valid scientific theories? Now they may both be theories, absolutely, but uh, what I want to uh, kind of point out is whether they are scientific theories, both of them, if they should hold equal value. So hopefully I'll, I'll be successful in, in at least getting you guys to maybe start thinking about this in a more in-depth manner. Now, I want to start with this, God versus science. Um, this is how the media portrays this, uh, this issue. It's like God versus science. The question is, is it really? Is it really God versus science or is it not? Are these two mutually exclusive? Uh, ideas. Um, I want to present you this quote by a, a professor at the University of Cambridge, uh, Simon Conway Morris, who's a, uh, a philosopher of science. Said this, Too much of modern day evolutionary discourse is done by stridency that in any other areas of science would be regarded as astonishing. To some extent, this is a reflection of the growing influence of so called intelligent design. This combines the worst of all possible worlds, the non science and flawed theology. The reason why I, I kind of I, I like this quote is because it kind of underscores the idea of if you believe in a Genesis story, and, and if you're a biblical literalist, uh, intelligent design is actually really flawed theology. It's actually really bad religion. Um, and, and what this idea of intelligent design, and hopefully, you know, as I go through the presentation, I'll show that uh, how intelligent design kind of came to be. It, it, it's something, it came to be actually in response to a, a couple of court cases. And so, um, you know, God versus science. These two can really coexist. And as a matter of fact, there are plenty of religious uh, uh, people that believe in evolution. Uh, my thesis advisor in college is you know, hardcore eight, uh, uh, Catholic. So, in, in, a, in a such, I want to go ahead and, and kind of explain what science is. I'm going to try to explain then what a theory is. And then I'm going to try to explain what evolutionary theory is. And then go on, if I have time, because I know I'm pressed for time here, go on into explaining what creationism, intelligent design is, and some of the refutations offered by those. So, uh, definition of science. Like any definition, I go to the dictionary. Uh, where else do we find better uh, definitions? So, science is derived from the word scientia, which means knowledge. And it's basically the knowledge covering general truths of the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through the scientific method and concerned with the physical world. So here's the big thing here, the scientific message and concerned with the physical world. Okay, that's, that's kind of the big thing about science. It concerns itself with the physical world, not necessarily the supernatural world. Okay? There really is no need for science to invoke any kind of supernatural ideas. The simple reason is because if it can be explained naturally, 
why do we need anything else? Why go and take that other uh, leap of faith forward? We have a, a very simple explanation here. So I want to discuss now and spend a little bit of time in discussing the scientific method and the steps of the side of the, and what these steps are. We start with observation, and basically you notice a phenomenon uh, in nature, whatever it may be. I, I can use my, my own uh, thesis. Um, I did work with malaria, and I saw uh, this, uh, there's a family of proteins that the malaria parasite excretes during, uh, as it's invading red blood cells. Okay? So these families, uh, this family of proteins called the erythrocyte binding ligands, um, what it are, uh, some of these have been characterized, and what they do is they recognize uh, red blood cell surface receptors, and it recognizes that it binds to them. Okay? Now there's a whole bunch of these proteins, not just one or two. So the observation is, well, we know what this specific one does, Well, what about these other ones? So that could be the beginning of an observation. And so I did some research, in other words, uh, some literature search. I went out and saw what everybody else was doing with this subject, and I read up on a lot of different things. I said, okay, I'm going to develop a hypothesis. What this hypothesis is, I said, well, given that this protein that I'm looking at, it was called EBL1, erythrocyte binding ligand 1, is in the same family as these other proteins, and we know what these other proteins do, I'm going to hypothesize that this protein does pretty much similar things. So then I went on and, and uh, set up a bunch of experiments to kind of uh, uh, try to prove myself uh, right or wrong, and, and, and a good experimental design, the way you, you design it, is you're actually trying to prove yourself wrong. Because if you fail at going, trying really hard to prove yourself wrong, then the only other option is that you're right. Um, so, so that's what I did. And then I arrived at conclusions. And I said, okay, after my experiments, I analyzed my data, I did my experimentation, I said, ah, here's my conclusion. This protein does, in fact, bind to self-service receptors and red blood cells. Now, and that's all well and done, and it's a very good process, and it works extremely well. What's even more important, though, is based off of that, you can make predictions, and that's the value, I think, of any scientific method, or scientific theory anyway, is it's what we call predictive value, okay? Uh, what kind of predictions can we make? So, uh, and to use you know, my example, I then went and predicted that, um, well, now that I know that this does bind, I'm going to predict that it's uh, based on its other uh, uh, similar homologs uh, and proteins that it's going to help in the invasion to help the parasite into red blood cells. And that's exactly essentially what happened. So this is how it works. This is actually the me mechanism of science. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit more about predictability and what it all means. Uh, can evolutionary theory be predictable? Okay, so, so let's talk about it. There's something called convergence, in, or uh, evolutionary uh, convergence. What this states is that um, given the same type of selective pressures, okay, given the same type of environment an animal lives in, it's probably going to evolve similar characteristics to another animal that lives in the same kind of environment. Okay? An example here, we have a shark, an ichthyosaur, and a dolphin. The ichthyosaur is now extinct. It's actually, it was a marine reptile. That lived millions of years ago. Shark is obviously a fish, lives today, and so is a dolphin, but the dolphin's a mammal. As you can see, the body plan of all these three is exactly the same. You know, now how could this be? You know, we have a fish, we have a reptile, and a mammal, all pretty much looking the same. Well, this is this is where this idea of evolutionary convergence comes comes into play. Uh, they were all of these animals are, um, and these are all uh, uh, you know uh, vertebrates. But they are all uh, in the same kind of environment, marine environment. So the same selective pressures apply to all of this. Now, if we look at here, there's a picture of placental animals, uh, mammals, and you and I are placental mammals. And we have squirrels and groundhogs and anteaters and uh, other things like voles and mice and things like that. If we look at the marsupials, which have a different uh, reproductive strategy in Australia, and, you know, Australia separated off from Pangea millions of years ago, and all the animals that were kind of stuck there kind of evolved in a separate pattern, okay, completely separate than these. However, if you look at their body shapes, their behaviors, their, uh, and, and, and a lot of, uh, like even feeding behaviors, um, they all pretty much started looking a lot like our placental mammals we see here, in, in the, even in America. For example, this is a flying squirrel. We have them here in Virginia. They're kind of rare. We do have them, and these guys have these folds 
uh, along the uh, uh, between the hind legs and the front legs, when they jump, they kind of glide. Well, there's marsupials. I don't know if you guys have heard of sugar gliders. Okay, these guys that uh, uh, are marsupials in Australia that evolve the exact same mechanism. Now, how could that be? You know, um, they they live in the same kind of eco ecological niche, so they evolve the same exact methods for survival. This is what we call bipedals. We see it here. You know, within a, a, a groundhog and a wombat, both occupy short, stocky bodies. They both occupy the same kind of environment, low to the ground. They usually dig and uh, uh, live underground and things like that. Anteaters, you know, we have an anteater here, like I think in Africa, there's a giant anteaters. And then we have a marsupial type of anteater. So these are basically examples of, con of uh, convergence. And you can predict, uh, based on, on how an animal lives in one part of the world, you can sort of even predict. Um, how a similar species in that same kind of environment is also going to uh, behave and, and look. But I want to take uh, this uh, into a couple other steps in regards to predictability. We have here um, two kinds of wells, right? Everybody's familiar with like your sperm wells, which have teeth, and then we have the baleen wells, which are like your blue wells have the, uh, the baleens that they, they're filter feeders. They basically take in a lot of water and then push the water out through these baleens and then they filter out the plankton. And, um, so, but these are very uh, similar animals, and it was predicted that a transitional well must have once existed, which had both uh, teeth and baleens. Okay, somebody said, well, it had to have a common ancestor, and as, uh, as such, uh, that fossil was found in 1966 it's called Aetocetus, and that's what it looks like. It actually had both teeth and baleen. Now, and, and that's what we would call a transitional fossil. I hear a lot that there are no transitional fossils in the world, and that it's like, well, you know, there's actually hundreds of thousands of transitional fossils. Evolution is a continuum. It is not a step, okay? It just, you know, we could be at this point in time transitional fossils in, in, in a couple million years to something else, who knows? Or we survive uh, longer than a couple hundred years, the way things are going, but um, anyway, so, you know, but, but that's, that's the idea. But I also want to kind of bring this in, again, to malaria. Uh, it's a subject I kind of know a little bit about, but I want to explain uh, to you this, and this is actually kind of neat. So you have um, this is the this is a red blood cell, and uh, what you have is this little parasite. This is malaria parasite. It's the uh, it's Plasmodium, and Falciparum is the species that actually is very uh, deadly to humans. It kind of looks like this. It's got these little teardrop uh, organelles uh, at the at the what we call the apical end of the. Uh, Parasite, and that protein I was telling about earlier, that EDL1 protein, is actually secreted here. Okay, so what this thing does, it kind of floats around in your bloodstream. So what it does, you get bit by a mosquito, uh, it, it injects the uh, the parasite, it goes into your liver where it, where it matures asexually. It's called an asexual reproduction phase in your liver cells, and that's actually asymptomatic. You don't get uh, symptoms. And then what tends to happen is it gets released from your uh, liver into, and it goes into your. Um, how's it going? It goes into your bloodstream, where then it starts invading your red blood cells. So what it does is it attaches. So you have a bunch of proteins on the surface of this uh, uh, parasite that recognize uh, surface receptors on the red blood cells. It attaches, and then it goes through this reorientation process where it sticks the top end, I guess you would say, uh, onto the red blood cell, and then a lot of proteins. These proteins are being secreted and allows it entry. And these are pictures. Actually, these were taken from my, this, uh, my thesis. These are. Uh, red blood cells with parasites inside of them. These blue things are parasites. And these right here are the parasites bursting out uh, from the red blood cells and they're going to go and bait another red blood cell in the cycle continues. So it's important to note that malaria has been a human pathogen for thousands of years. And it's not a bacteria, it's not a virus. It's a very complicated uh, uh, eukaryotic parasite. And it's got multiple life stages in, in mosquitoes and in humans, but there's different species of malaria that infect birds and reptiles, and, and each one, each species kind of evolve uh, to adapt itself to its own host. Yeah? Does it have its own DNA? Yes. A parasite? Mm -hmm. Absolutely it does. Uh, like, all, like all cells, it has its own DNA. And as a matter of fact, and that's what makes it so tricky to cure, by the way, it's because these proteins that they secrete, uh, the parasite, your immune system usually recognizes a virus or bacteria, especially if it's endemic to a region. Okay, it recognizes it, and it usually tends to, to kind of fight the infection. What these little critters do is they have an arsenal based on their complex DNA 
that they actually excrete different proteins at different times, which really confuses the immune system of hosts, which is why we really can't seem to shake it in areas where this is a death. So that's a, uh, an issue that a lot of the uh, malaria researchers are actually working on now, is how do we find a vaccine target? Well, how do we find a vaccine target if this thing is always creating different proteins and always changing things around? It's kind of, kind of interesting. But I want to talk about um, another disease, uh, and I'll tie this in here in a minute, called uh, sickle cell anemia. Uh, have you guys heard of sickle cell anemia? You guys all kind of familiar with it? It's actually a genetic disorder, okay? And it's caused by a point mutation, just one little mutation from an A to a T, adenine to a tyrosine, in the hemoglobin gene. And the hemoglobin gene is responsible, uh, it's in the gene in the red blood cells that makes hemoglobin that, that thing allows the oxygen to be carried throughout the body. When this point mutation occurs, it's called hemoglobin S, and that's what actually causes sickle cell. And what it does is um, it, it, it kind of distorts the cells and forms this sickle shape. These are healthy cells, these are uh, sickle cells. And what that does is that obviously oxygen can't be carried very well with these cells. It, uh, these cells are also very sticky. They don't move through your capillary beds very well, so they actually end up clogging things up. Very nasty stuff. The interesting thing is, is you, you must have the mutation from both parents. And uh, so, you know, in, in order to get it, so you have to be what we call homozygous, right? So you have to have a copy of both mutations from both parents, okay? If you get one from one parent but not the other, you're going to be a carrier, but you won't exhibit the symptoms of the disease. And so there's a lot of issues involved with that. So how, how, are, we, how are these things related? Okay, and that's kind of where I'm getting at, this idea of, um, of, of this correlation, and, and I'll tie this into predictability here in a minute. Malaria parasites require normal blood cells to utilize hemoglobin for growth. Sickle cells are not permissive for parasite growth. So therefore, the theory or the hypothesis is that uh, malaria parasites actually exhibit a strong selective pressure for sickle cell trait. Okay? Um, how do we know this? Well, this is a map that looks at the areas that have a lot of sickle cell anemia. Okay? Look at that in Africa, most of India, over here in South America. This is the map where it shows malaria. Okay? So, I actually have a video um, that's about 10 minutes long. I don't know if we have time to show it, though. That kind of gets into that from HHMI. Do we have time, or should I just continue on? It's it's about YouTube minutes. is blocked. Huh? YouTube is blocked. No, it's not on YouTube. It's my computer. Oh. We can we can move forward. I mean, it's well, up to you. It's up to you guys. You Let's want to watch it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. It's about ten minutes long. Devon and Sky Cooper are brother and sister. and sickle cell and how they're correlated. But, you know, when going back to the idea of predictability, um, you are now able to predict um, where we can find sickle cell anemia. And that actually has medical value. So it's not just, you know, well, who cares? Uh, actually, it's quite important. So the whole point of this is kind of just to show you the importance of predict predictive value when it comes to theories. Um, so let, let me uh, quickly go into um, what a theory is, again, um, the analysis of a set of facts in relation to one another. This is kind of important, a set of facts in relation to one another. This is what a scientific theory is, a scientific one. It is not just something somebody came up and said, ah, you know, we'll go ahead and call it a theory. Uh -uh. It took a lot of work to make uh, something a theory. Or a plausible scientifically uh, acceptable general principle or body of principles offered to explain the phenomena. For example, the wave theory of light, or the theory of gravity. These are all scientific theories. Uh, none of these are disputed, uh, with the exception of evolutionary theory for, for some reason. Um, so evolutionary theory it is a theory that states that various types of animals and plants have their origin in other pre-existing types 
and that the distinguishable differences are due to modifications in successive generations. So in other words, as generations move through time of animals, they tend to change. And each one of those changes is, is going to be affected um, and, and selected upon uh, by you know, natural selection. So uh, Charles Darwin, um, and of course you can't have an evolution talk without really talking about Charles Darwin. He, he actually didn't really uh, uh, discover evolutionary theory. What Charles Darwin did was he gave us the mechanism for evolution. Evolutionary theory was discussed even before Charles Darwin. People were talking about evolution, uh, you know, a couple hundred years even before him. But he gave us the mechanism, okay? This idea of natural selection that we've talked about here, and I'll expand on again. Natural selection it has three ingredients. Variation, selection, and time. Variation is these mutations that we see that are passed on from offspring, uh, parent to offspring. As, as Sean Carroll said in the video, you have about 40 to 60 mutations in your body that your parents didn't have, which can lead to uh, different types of phenotypes, okay? So this variation, these mutations, are selected upon. So what's selection? Well, in the case of the sickle cell gene, malaria was a selective pressure. In the case of these bugs here, these beetles, it's a bird that eats the green ones. Say, these all live in a sandy uh, desert area. Well, these are going to camouflage very well. These green ones are not. The bird's going to see the green ones, and boom, next thing you know it, and, and in insects, and even in some small mammals, this happens very quickly. You have a population of animals that's completely different than the original population. This is natural selection. This is how it works, and we see it all the time. And then the third ingredient is time. It takes time. It takes generations for a population to really change. So the evidence for evolution is a scientific theory and an analysis of a set of facts in relation to one another. That's the fossil record. Geologic time scale distribution of species that fits with that fossil record. We have genetics. We have molecular biology, which is general observations. All disciplines of science arrive at the same conclusions regarding evolution. That's why it's a strong theory, because it takes facts from many disciplines of science, and they all point to the same exact thing as Charles Darwin had discovered, which is natural evolution by natural selection. So let me fast forward here to uh, creationism and what this is. According again to the dictionary, it's a doctrine or theory holding that matter, uh, the various forms of life in the world were created by God out of nothing, and usually in a way described in Genesis. Okay? Basically, that's it. We are all made, boom, out of nothing, here we are. That's exactly what it says. However, as I will uh, discuss in a couple later slides if we have time, um, Creationism um, is, is only valid to be taught in church and at home. Uh, court cases have ruled against teaching it in schools, public schools, and the simple reason is because it violates our First Amendment rights, uh, the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of the Constitution. It's a religious idea. It is not a scientific idea. Uh, this, this is simply has nothing to do with anything else. It's just the courts have decided that. But, so, in, 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 in uh, Kind of uh, in a way to reintroduce creationism in the, in the science classroom, uh, intelligent design was created. And what, according to their website here, it's a scientific research program as well as a community of scientists, philosophers, and other scholars who seek evidence for design in nature. Now, here's here's the part that I don't like about this: philosophers. Who needs philosophers in science, right? Um, who needs philosophers anyway, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, philosophy is a subject I love to hate because it's just, it's, I know we need it, it's great, I know it's... it's I'm teaching it this semester, I'm trying to uh, get them to take it, yes. Yeah, no, no, I, I urge you guys, because I got caught in graduate uh, class one time, I took an environmental ethics class, thinking, oh, we're going to talk about environmentalism, it'll be great, you know, animal rights and environment and stuff, and the whole class was nothing but hardcore philosophy, we got into Kant and utilitarianism, and I'm yeah. just like... Okay. What is this? Oh, I thought we were going to talk about how to sink the wells. But no, that's not what it's about. So, so really, it's very important that you guys understand philosophy, even though I hate it. But anyways. Say so so what now? And read the description for your class. Yeah, and read the description for your class before you take Yeah, number one rule in college, yeah. So, um, although we can have philosophers of science, we don't really need philosophers in science. The theory of intelligent design, intelligent design holds that certain features of the universe and of living things are best explained by an intelligent cause, not an indirect process, such as natural selection. So basically these guys are saying, how can we turn creationism 
and make it scientific. We can do this. Let's turn this into like a scientific argument. So, here comes all these like scientists. I don't know if you guys have heard of Michael Behe and some of these other guys. Dembski is another one. And they said, okay, let's make this really scientific. And Michael Behe is actually a, a chemist, uh, you know, a published chemist. A, a hard, you know, he's a scientist. But he came up with this idea of irreducible complexity, where he basically says that complex organisms, biological systems, are so complex that they could not be reduced any further than what they are. So natural selection clearly can't work. It's not possible when you look at things like a flagella. Look how complicated this thing is. There's like over 50 proteins that are involved. And all these 50 proteins have to work in sync with each other to make a bacterial flagella work. Well, how could you? You remove one of these, and you no longer have a working flagella. And he's absolutely right. You don't. However, where the flaw in this logic is, and this is something that uh, was discussed, this is what they, they call this the poster child for intelligent design, by the way. This one. And this was discussed in the Dover trial in Pennsylvania when they were trying to um, sue uh, the Dover uh, School to introduce intelligent design as, a, as an alternative to evolution. What, they, what, what this fails is that if you actually break down, this is the uh, cell membrane, okay, you got the outer membrane and the inner membrane, you got this interstitial body here. And these, these places there, and then of course it's a flagella that spins. When you break this down, these proteins, um, actually, the, the, uh, there's homologies between, so this is an E. coli bacteria. We all know what E. coli is, right? We got it in our gut, they help us digest, some of them are bad. This is the, 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 um, a, what we call a type 3 secretory um, um, uh, protein structure in the, the bacteria that causes the bubonic plague. Okay, which is very nasty stuff. So uh, Yersinia pestis. These proteins and these proteins are extremely homologous. I mean, they're homologous. They're almost identical. What this, uh, what they, what these proteins here are responsible. This mechanism is responsible for excreting bad proteins, and that's how they kind of get you sick. The bacteria invades your cells, and they, they kind of shoot these proteins inside of you, and then those proteins have biological activity and get you sick. Well, they're exactly the similar to this uh, flagella protein uh, mechanism. What that means is that even though the flagella right now is assembled, or it looks like it's assembled in a way that could not be reduced to a uh, lower, uh, you know, lower system, uh, we see that, as a matter of fact, all of these proteins have other functions in other cells. So it could very well be that they have evolved into um, you know, this mechanism here. It's actually not that far-fetched to think that. As a matter of fact, it is what the standing uh, theory is with, with flagella. So this argument was used in, in the Dover trial, and the judge was convinced. He goes, yeah, absolutely. This irreducible complexity is flawed. Yeah. Does this apply to sperm and stuff like that? Is it flagella as well? Or is that a different mechanism? It, it's uh, probably a similar mechanism. I'm pretty sure that the sperm mechanism is a little different, because that uh, comes from a different uh, type. So these are bacterial cells. Sperm is obviously eukaryotic cells, or uh, these are prokaryotes. So, but this, there's probably a lot of similarities there. I'm not, uh, you know, is a sperm biologist, but uh, but uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm sure that there's some homology there as well. So, in regards to, you know, what do we think? Is there evidence for intelligent design? What can we predict from intelligent design? What predictive value does intelligent design give us? Um, even though you can say, well, you know, um, things were designed that in in India we have uh, malaria, so the sickle cell is great intelligent design. Really, a, a curing a disease with another disease is actually intelligent. It makes you think. A bit. So, what would be more plausible, right? So, some other claims: mutations have been observed to destroy late or corrupt genetic information, or to be neutral, but have not been observed to add information. Is this true? Let's see. Evolution is just a theory. Well, it is a theory, but is it just a theory? What does that mean? People that use this term, I hate it because they're doing one of two things. They're either trying to deceive you purposely to not to really dumbing down what scientific theories are, or they don't know themselves. And when I hear this in a political arena a lot, it's bad news. I mean, it, it, don't don't dumb it down. Evolution is a theory. It's not just a theory. It's a scientific theory. Very well established. Some creationists claim they can uh, accept microevolution, but do not accept macroevolution. Well, what does that mean? Well, I heard that very recently. Huh? I heard that very recently well, from somebody. They, they believe in one, but not the other. Does know what the difference between micro and macroevolution is? Uh, isn't it like the macro and the species and the micro and the species? Okay, yeah, absolutely. 
Anybody else? I couldn't hear her. Is that, do you know what the difference between micro and macro evolution is? I don't know. Anybody else? Small That's all egg. I remember, Dan, that was great. <laughs> micro is like within the genes, right? Okay. Uh, well, it's, evolution always happens within the genes. The big difference, and as you pointed out, right, is macro evolution usually deals with speciation. It's at a bigger scale. But the real difference between micro and macro evolution is time. That's it, time. We see, you know, like humans evolve over thousands of years with this malaria parasite, and we develop sickle cell anemia. Again, thousands of years. You, you know, stretch evolution out over millions of years. Okay, it's again, evolution is a continuum. It's not like, you know, it's not steps. You know, it's a continuum. It, it, you gradually change. And what you're seeing then is change to the point where species are, are going to dif differentiate. And if they isolate, for example, we, look, we have to look at how plate tectonic works. Because plate tectonic, um, like the example with the Australia, you have a species of animals that have common ancestors, but now are isolated, and they continue to evolve in, in Australia the way they had in marsupials. That's the difference between micro and macro. That's it. So just because we can see microevolution in a laboratory, but we can't see macroevolution, if we were to see macroevolution, you better be able to live millions of years. Because that's the only way you can see it. How do we know that it happens? We have DNA evidence. Inter-evolutionary developmental biology. <laughs> we have now genes. Uh, we found, and actually Sean Carroll, the gentleman that we saw in the video, uh, has uh, worked a lot on evil evil and he discovered or works with toolkit genes. These are genes that regulate the expression of other genes during embryonic development. Again, evolutionary developmental biology. What these genes do is during uh, development, so this is a fly embryo and this is a mouse embryo, in certain, in, they get segmented, a lot of embryos are segmented, right? Uh, different genes express different uh, uh, or express certain genes that have an impact on what other genes during that development are going to have. So here you have these genes that code for uh, you know the mouthpiece and the head and the wings and, and so on and so forth. You see these same exact genes, same exact genes in a mouse embryo. As a matter of fact, they're so similar and so conserved evolutionarily that you can take a red uh, a cell from these red this red area here and put it in a fly embryo. And what do you expect to see then? You think a, 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 a fly with a mouse head? Absolutely not. Those genes function exactly the way they do normally in a fly. A fly develops normally after that. Now that's interesting because what we're seeing now is genes during developmental uh, embryonic development that actually control how things and, and through interspecies. What, how evolution works on these things is, we, again, we talk about these point mutations. Imagine there's a point mutation here, and all of a sudden this wing gets a little bigger because of it. And imagine this happens over and over and over. These homeobox genes, point mutations, they do add to information. You can have very complex systems from very simple genes. And that's exactly the case. And, and evolutionary developmental biology is the nail that drives in the coffin for your complexity. Kills it. I mean, it's right here. We have the molecular evidence, genetic and molecular evidence. So, I know it's all, uh, you know, I'm running a little late here, but can extra creationism and evolution be given equal validity in the eyes of science? Uh, I think not. What about in the eyes of philosophy? Well, that's a different story, right? We can argue this philosophically, certainly. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of great Christian apologists, philosophers that are very tough to, to argue against. But, you know, how do you feel about teaching creationism alongside evolution? Is that really, you know, uh, that, uh, to me, that's not the way you do it. You want to teach creationism, that's done at Old Mormon Church. But when you want to learn science, that's, that's, um, and that's supposed to be God here hiding my evolution right there. <laughs> Should uh, creationism be tied to us? Is that a sign? <laughs> if I start smoking, please let me know. Uh, but should creationism be taught anywhere else? Do you think that we should learn about creationism or intelligent design maybe in a, I don't know, a philosophy class or religious studies class? I so much personally wouldn't be so much against that. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, if evolution has so many um, evidence, why are we reject, why are some people rejecting it? Well, that's a good question. Why do you think people are rejecting evolution? Um, what, 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 what does everybody else think? Huh? Morals. 
forms. Yeah. Yeah. The humanities rejected scientific progress in a re re it's a repetition and repetitional circle all throughout human history. Yeah, because like we weren't as developed back then because we, we don't like rely on religion, but now that we have the mechanism of why we still rejected. Yeah. I would I've got to pose um I would say that well, a lot of people still grow up in religious uh, households and when when you grow up you you build models based off those households, you base models of thinking on those households and as humans we usually have uh, the tendency to anything that goes against that model we think is totally wrong and science I would say is is the way out of that cycle of like it, it, science helps you readjust those models so it uh, reflects better what life is. People who can't necessarily change those models probably uh, haven't learned to, to accept uh, new evidence and science itself. But yeah, but yeah, when people get sick and stuff, they rely on science and stuff. Like, well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the kind of the kicker there, you know, and Give me those right, pills. It's, it's all of a sudden, uh, you know, and, and again, things like malaria. If it wasn't for evolutionary biology, we would have no idea why malaria is or, or so, so widespread here in this country. If, if malaria is genetic, so when the cells get through mitosis, why are some of the cells, cells, cells change shape? Like cell cell cell. Cell. Yeah. Cell. Yeah. So that gets into more of the, um, so red blood cells are made in a bone marrow, and so I, I haven't studied sickle cell closely, so I'm not sure of all the mechanisms, but they're created in, in your uh, bone marrow, and it, it's at that point when those genes are, effect, are affected, depending on the cells where those genes are being expressed. So the bone marrow, you know, all the cells in your body, not all the genes are going to be expressed equally throughout, so you're not going to have a, like a whole, like, not all your blood cells are going to be um, sickle cell. So yeah, there's the other factors that come into play at that point when, when we talk about gene expression inside the system. So absolutely, but the genes, the traits are different. It's kind of like if you're prone to cancer, you know, um, you're prone to cancer. You can get it anywhere, right? Uh, it depends on what your genetics are and suppressors, and, and, and may even be have to do with other environmental stimuli. I'm not sure, but that's a good question. Um, um, but yeah, that's that's kind of. Good. But it does enough where it can cause damage. And some people are different. Some people have sickle cell, have different symptoms. Some people have the disease not as bad as others. So it all depends on the individual person and how they express those genes. So, so absolutely, um, you know, these are great questions. And, and absolutely, why are people, you know, so, uh, why are people, why do they hate evolution? Why do they hate not? You know, I, 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 uh, it blows my mind, you know, and, and of course, uh, it's the only evolutionary theory, by the way, that's really being rejected by the religious establishment. The only one. 39% of Americans understand evolution. That yeah. leaves how many? 69% yeah. not getting it or don't believe in it it's, or totally rejecting it. It's, it's, you don't see these guys out there debating the intelligent no, no, falling theory to be taught alongside intelligent evolution, right? 40% you know, are circulationists. About, it's about, uh, yeah, it's... It's thirty nine percent was the latest one that yeah. that believe in evolution, right? That, yeah. that accept evolution as that fact. That accept evolution as yeah. fact. We don't yeah. believe in it. We don't believe in anything, right? We accept it as fact or false. Yeah. Um, that's that's a, a small, tremendously small number, right? It's yeah, it's very small compared to some of the other Western country or right. Western. So just uh, this to end here, I just want to. There's some a couple of court cases. Uh, 68 uh, against Arkansas, the Supreme Court invalidated Arkansas statute that prohibited the teaching of evolution. They were actually trying to stop evolution from being taught. Uh, 1982, uh, the decision gave detailed definition of the term science, and that's where we get this. Is intelligent design science based on this definition of this court case? It's a federal court that uh, creation science is not in fact science. Uh, and then we have 1987. We have the uh, Creationism Act was uh, deemed unconstitutional. And then, of course, the big one in 2005 in Dover, where uh, the judge, by the way, the judge was appointed by George W. Bush, I believe. He said, it's abundantly clear that the board's intelligent design policy violates the Establishment Clause, and ID cannot uncouple itself from its creationist and thus religious antecedents. This is the ruling that destroyed intelligent design from being taught in public schools. This was it, this one here. As a matter of fact, I think Rick on his website, what's your website? Flamewarrior.com. Flamewarrior.com. Uh, he has actually a very uh, revised version of the, uh, what? Abbreviated, no. Abbreviated. Attribute, attributions. Uh, yeah, okay, abbreviated version of, of this uh, ruling. And it's actually, I urge everybody to read 
As a matter of fact, if you type, if you Google Dover, uh, there's actually a lot of information on a lot of others as well. So anyway, to leave you then with the quote from Charles Darwin, uh, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful, have been or be. I want to thank uh, Sean Carroll. He actually edited my presentation. He's the Vice President for Science Education at HHMI. He's the gentleman in the video, that nearly the video. Rick Wingrove, with the CEO of Bentwood Atheus. The rest of the directors of Bentwood Atheus, Ellen Birch, Jeff Wismer, and Harry Santiago. And Jason Osborne, who's a co-worker of mine, but he's an executive director of Google Research. I, I highly recommend you guys check out this website, spellyquest.org. He actually gave a talk here last year, maybe you guys should invite yeah, back. Yeah, tons of fossils um, over. He runs a lot of fossils. He's actually doing some really cool stuff with fossils. He's joining National Geographic. He's doing a lot of good things right now. Smithsonian Institute is asking for services and stuff. So. And Ms. Wing, Wingard, the biologist teacher? Wingfield. Wingfield. Wingfield, Wingfield. Wingfield yes. Yeah. She loves John Carroll. Yeah. Absolutely loves him. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's, um, he's actually, uh, and, and uh, what we're doing at Howard Hughes Medical Institute right now is we're working on um, a uh, four TV uh, science talks so where they're going to uh, focus heavily on, it, on uh, evolution, which is good because we need more people to kind of learn about this. And we want to thank you. Yeah, thank you. Do you have any other questions or any other uh, questions about five minutes? Or? Well, they've got to catch a bus. you got to catch a bus? Okay. But you, well, you're welcome to stay longer if you like if you want to talk some more or ask questions. Anybody else with questions? Told them not to bother me Talk to some prophets But everything they talk to me Could have been gotten by A frontal lobotomy They brought me darkness And in this darkness It dawned on me The amazing gift Copernicus brought to me Thus began my apostasy A prophecy But it gave me Most of all the art we see I was there Newton saw the fruit drop on me When science succeeded Philosophy's monopoly science is music Like a child we use it To view the world The way the violin views it Philosophy you tell us Why we confuse it and why we are right to do science is music Like a child we use it To view the world the way the violin views it Philosophy will tell us why we confuse it The truth and why we are right to do